uh, if you can say what you think it is about My Hair Academia that kind of has that lovely overwhelming arc that just everybody loves and is very popular. Uh, just on a base level, I think the animation is lovely. You know, that's, that's always part of the appeal. Uh, but I think culturally, superheroes are kind of a big thing right now. They're pretty popular. Uh, but, but what I really, really love about the show is that it subverts a lot of these superhero uh, tropes in really clever ways. Like, uh, for instance, the prodigies of, of Class 1A are the ones that deal with the most anxiety and, and like, lack of self-worth. Uh, so I, I just think it's, it's a lot of really good character-driven uh, moments that you can really root for as an audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Act 2 of My Hero Academia starts off in the middle of 2016, and the series is more or less a global phenomenon. When we last left off, we were at our highest volume sales of all time, with some extremely iconic scenes and characters. In addition, the first My Hero Academia games started rolling out, such as My Hero Academia Clash Heroes Battle, which is dead, just like every other game. We also saw the beginning of a multitude of MHA spin-offs, such as Vigilantes and Team Up Missions. While these spin-offs definitely offer their own unique things to the series as a whole, they fail to hold a candle to the main series quality. Speaking of holding a candle to the main series, we also get the first two movies of the series during this act. These will get their own section later, unfortunately. The adaptation would prove to be instrumental in the series' success, with season 2 especially performing extremely well in both Japan and abroad. Needless to say, the series was printing money. Figurines, clothing, backpacks, you name it, there was MHA merch of it. I didn't dedicate any segment to season 1 last video, but I'll try and make quick asides for anime seasons this time since there are a lot more and there is a lot more to say about them. Now, where did Act 1 leave off? In the micro, we had Midoriya coming to accept the consequences of his reckless use of his court, as well as the burden of one for all slowly closing in on him. Bakugo coming to accept that maybe being a shithead is bad, and Ochako coming to grips with her interest in Deku, and Shoto finally feeling like he can move through his abusive household. In the macro, we have the complete upheaval of the ideology keeping Japanese hero society going, as the pillar of justice and symbol of peace finally collapses. In addition, we see the end of simple ideas of heroism and villainy, and move forward to an age of more nuanced methods of the two aforementioned concepts. Act 2 is quite an interesting time. To some people, it's when the series kind of grew up, in a sense. It demonstrates that MHA has quite a darker side to it, and introduces more mature concepts and themes. At some at some points, the tone of the series got so dark that Horikoshi himself stated that he struggled working through it. Act 2 also gives us MHA's second editor change. The first editor, Hitoshi Koike, worked between June 2013 and June 2014. If you remember, MHA didn't start printing until July of that year. This basically means that Koike and Horikoshi worked for an entire year on the first three chapters. Everything after the first three was edited by Kenko Monji, who took over between Chapter 4 and the School Festival arc. We had MHA's best sales, movies coming down the pipeline, games releasing spin-offs in progress as we take our first steps into the next stage of my Hero Academia. Okay, not a necessarily strong arc to start us off for Act 2, and it's generally perceived as one of the worst arcs of the series. Surely this is something that can never be topped. It doesn't do anything egregious. I think the arc suffered simply by being placed after such an immensely strong stretch of the series, as it's not super interesting and kind of drags on. This change in quality is felt especially through the anime adaptation, as it did an amazing job elevating the source material of the Forest Training Camp arc and the Kamino arc, only to then have a noticeable drop off in adaptation quality, and made an arc that already felt like a drag even more severe by padding with anime original content that, to be frank, wasn't good. It also saw a small decline in volume sales, however, this also could be due to the anime not airing at the time of the volume's printing. The arc itself has one standout moment among a string of just okay ones, but it's not all bad. The retrospective series thus far has been overwhelmingly positive in terms of how we view My Hero Academia, and we're about to get a little critical. I want to reiterate once again that by the nature of reviews, this will be subjective. If you disagree, there is nothing wrong with that, and I don't want to rag on it too long, so let's get into the arc itself. Provisional License Exam, or in its shortened form, PLE, does a a lot for Class A's growth in terms of their abilities or capabilities. We see them come up with super moves and work towards finally becoming licensed heroes. Deku is in a state where his arms are ticking time bombs if he doesn't change his fighting style, and fast. People clown on this moment, but I think it's very understandable from Deku's point of view. He had spent his entire short tenure as a hero trying to imitate All Might. This would include his fighting style, so using his undamaged legs would not be a thought that crosses his mind. Pair this with the fact that our MC is a chronic overthinker, and you have a recipe for an ironically simple epiphany that will guide how he thinks about his own power going forward. We finally see Deku mature his power 
power set again, as he incorporates kicking into his fighting style. He also gets an upgrade to his costume, and in my humble opinion, I love Deku's costume so much. I love that every single part of it has some reason for existing. The green suit is a reference to his mother's original design. The bunny mask exists to imitate All Might's pointy hair, and similarly, the respirator is to act as his never-ending smile. He incorporates some brand new arm braces that exist to reduce the strain on his arms, and some fancy iron soles to enhance the power of his kicks. And we'll soon see later in the arcs to come, this symbolically enriching costume only gets more progressive from here. I think Deku developing this new fighting style is also another very pungent reminder that he is now on his own. And instead of repeating everything All Might did that led to where we are now, he is slowly separating himself from All Might's identity, starting with his fighting style and coming up his methods of heroism. Speaking of separating oneself from their inspiration, we see something similar from Ochako in this arc. Much like how she wanted to be independent of him in the sports festival, she makes the conscious decision to start locking away her feelings from Midoriya and focus on her work as a hero to try and come at it by herself. What we also get to see in this arc, but also in the act entirely, is the League of Villains beginning to become more proactive under the new leadership of the now mentorless Tomura Shigaraki. We see this near immediately with this new act by Toga sneaking into the test to not only obtain some information, but to get blood for future use. She encounters Midoriya who, despite knowing that she wasn't Uraraka, still saves her regardless. This is what spawns her curiosity into Midoriya and Ochako's relationship, and who is worthy of being saved. Oh yeah, she sneaks in because there are other hero schools, I guess. I almost forgot about that, just like Hori. This cements the parallel development that both the heroes and League go through, which is something we'll definitely get into later. PLE and by extension Act 2 begins to show us fights becoming a little more elaborate, despite still not being amazing choreography-wise. This could also go hand-in-hand -hand with previous points about the simplicity of heroism and villainy being left behind in Act 1, and by extension, so too is the simplicity of its fighting. We see the final fight that ends that generation of thematic simplicity quite literally be ended by two dudes punching each other as hard as they can, and the first major fight of Act 2 being one of pretty decent choreography, as if out of necessity, the fighting styles of old need to evolve. Deku vs Bakugo 2 is the very, very end of the Provisional Hero License exam arc, and it's pretty much the only reason why people even think about this arc past its premiere. This fight is when we get to see Bakugo and Midoriya finally become actual rivals after years of just one-sided bullying, showcasing a type of envy that was once hidden building up inside of Bakugo that not only catches Midoriya off guard, but the viewer as well. All this time, he has been straddled with the guilt of feeling like he is responsible for ending All Might, and his overwhelming feeling of inadequacy when compared to his childhood friend. At the core of Bakugo being, strength and violence are two necessary components to him. Due to his upbringing, he saw strength as necessary, and that weakness was like being a burden on society. This is a prime example as to why, as a child, he could never understand the quirkless Midoriya Izuku who, despite being powerless, still maintained a strong fighting spirit. Even after he was kidnapped by a villain group, his mother scolds him and tells him if he were stronger, this wouldn't have happened. Bakugo throughout his life internalized these feelings, until Midoriya was in UA. If even a weak, quirkless nobody like him would receive praise for his accomplishments that have nothing to do with strength, what is Bakugo without his strength. To protect himself from that thought, he projects his self-perceived weakness onto Deku. Deku vs Bakugo 2 serves as his inferiority complex exploding in his face. While I think Bakugo and Midoriya are cool individually, the portrayal of their dynamic here isn't exactly something I'm fond of. It's not just here either, but much of the series. We see previously in the final exams arc of Act 1 how their relationship is portrayed as a two-way problem of miscommunication and dislike of each other, when in reality, it's entirely one-sided, just like this fight is. This fight has interesting choreography, which was massively visually elevated by the anime adaptation, and that's about the end of the interest of this fight for me. Deku Deku vs Bakugo 2 is a trend of a bigger issue in their dynamic, which is how Deku pretty much never gets his own input on how Bakugo had treated him. He gives his side of the story at times, like how he always looked up to him and stuff like that, but he never gets his own moment to dive deep into how Bakugo had made him feel all those years. What this fight is, is a former bully trauma dumping onto his victim, and at this point, is not at all friends with. This definitely partially plays a part in Deku's characterization of how he cares less about himself and more about others, seeing as how someone like Bakugo takes priority when it comes to their feelings, but like I said earlier, it is a disappointing trend for their relationship as to how hilariously one-sided all of its moments are. Even if you want to take into account the fact that this is Deku yet again being careless, where do you think the necessity for being so dismissive towards his own feelings came from? Who do you think made him feel like his emotions don't matter? That his kindness shouldn't be something freely given by choice, but something he has to give other people? More on that later in Act 3. Though. After their fight, All Might steps in and apologizes for not noticing how much pain Bakugo was in, which is also funny given how the same arc Midoriya places all the blame on himself for destroying his arms and not being able to save Bakugo. The save to win, win to save dynamic that All Might presents also serves the same function of doing absolutely nothing for Midoriya, and existing solely for Bakugo's sake, and barely at that. Perhaps it'll come later in Act 3, but has hardly been utilized except for the joint training arc. It implies that they are two sides of the same coin, two incomplete halves of All Might's heroism, and sure, that might be true, but it's more accurately something used to elevate Bakugo's 
role in the story and to diminish Midoriya's individuality again. The fight also served as yet another sigh of relief for the audience, or in some ways a redemption for Bakugo, as it ended up making him much more tolerable and giving him characterization beyond just being a piece of shit. Overall, Provisional License Exam Arc was one of the most disappointing of the series, with only a few standout moments. I can understand how it came to be, however, as following up on the Kamino arc was going to be a tall order. Now, there is a lot to say about the following arc, but I'll let someone who is a bit more passionate about it than myself take over for it. Huh? Oh, hey. After his fight with All for One, All Might retained massive injuries, so massive it scarred him for the rest of his life. Really being able to even walk, All Might still decided to forego his own health for the sake of saving others. This is called sacrifice, disregarding your own situation for someone else's sake, no matter how detrimental. And I think sacrifice permeates the entirety of this arc. A lot of people think that Mario should have been the protagonist. A lot of people also think Far From Home is a good movie. <laughs> Let me get this out of the way, right? Because we all know that Deku's a pussy, right? Like, he's weak, he's shy, he's pretty much a scaredy cat. Dare I say, he's garbage. And these aren't necessarily good qualities for someone who's destined to be the number one. No, Mario's different. He's strong, confident. He has the type of levity that every room needs i mean look he even has raw attacks he fought off overhaul for five whole minutes which is impossible but let's just let's just move on what sets them apart is that sacrifice i mentioned earlier when the call to action happened when a poor little girl who was visibly scarred and scared showed up right in front of them deku was the only one willing to fight willing to sacrifice his life nida's plans and all sense of logic telling him this would be a bad idea kept Mirio away from reaching out a hand to her, but Deku just didn't care about that. Mirio let an abuse victim go because it wasn't part of the plan. Mirio doesn't have any inherent recklessness, any ringing in his ears that shuts down all prior judgment just for the sake of someone else. He's calculated just like his mentor. In that moment, I think Horikoshi cemented what this arc is truly about. Heart, soul, strength isn't up to how capable you are or how suitable you are to be some kind of hero. It's that inkling of a feeling, that, that drive to dive headfirst into obscurity at even the chance of helping someone else. How those instincts come true through nature, like Deku, instinct like Eri, corruption like Overhaul, redemption like Mirio, or death by Nidai. Deku being the most ironic one here, being the most incompetent but the perfect candidate, Someone who's perfect for one for all because he's so imperfect. And it's because of that, he's the only one that escapes the arc unscathed. Multiple students visualizing their worry, conversations about respective internships, a visible distress and slow build up to tension where we see Izuku unable to sleep or train, lead to the cast feeling more full and vibrant. Another rated scene from this arc was the Heroes Don't Cry scene where Izuku disables himself from communicating his emotions and the trio set up in the Hosu arc come to comfort him. A bit of classic cheesy MHA, but in a way that's delightful. And I wish this trio got more time to shine. Sticking to 1A, uh, Ochako does things. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, I've never been a total fan of the shonen boss rush. They usually amount to characters I don't care about, fighting villains I don't care about, and that are also ugly. Like, Jujutsu Kaisen had a whole episode devoted to Panda and Megamaru. I, I, I do not, I, I don't care. And while Horikoshi does a pretty decent job with this format, this arc to me is first and foremost a character study on Deku. What heroism means to him and what heroism means to the people around him. Which is where I think the arc is at its best. And while there's definitely nothing wrong with developing your supporting cast more, I do think the middle portion suffers from distracting from the point of this arc a little bit. Let's talk about Kirishima for a bit. He exemplifies sacrifice in a different way than Izuku does. While Izuku and All Might notoriously sacrifice something good to help other people, Kirishima sacrifices something bad to help other people, his fear. And just like Izuku, he subverts the concept of manliness by not shoving away fear, but facing them head on, so others don't have to. This is great development for Kirishima, and also Tamaki, who kinda has to separate his own manliness from his own anxiety, or rather, making manless out of his anxiety. 
But as stated before, this is a Deku character study and, as will become a pattern in this act, he's removed from the spotlight to highlight these characters. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. A until we get to the girls. Remember when we said Ochako's arc is about proactivity? Her being unable to really save Deku nor Nadai in this arc starts to train a thought that will guide her throughout the rest of the story. It was only a few arcs ago where she promised herself not to get distracted with idealization or crush and just focus on her hero work. Oh yeah, she has a crush on Deku. We kind of just forgot to mention that. I only wish Horikoshi really capitalized on the fact that Deku and Ochako, for probably the first time in the story, went through the exact same trauma. Why couldn't they be forms of comfort for each other, venting to each other after the arc is over how what they just went through was messed up and how those events shape how they feel in the moment. The opportunity was right there, but Horikoshi misses the mark. She still does nothing in this arc. I mean, heck, she even has a off-screen rescue mission. I can't stress this enough. Ochako, who is a main character and a rescue hero, has her rescue scene off-screen? when her arc is about learning how important it is to rescue other people. But Tamaki, someone who we didn't know existed prior to this arc, gets a whole fight. None of my business. Also, we all know that Nedre sucks, like, like really bad, right? Yue is the top hero school, like in all of Japan. And Nedre is like, what, the third best student in that school? However, unlike her contemporaries, she gets almost nothing to work with. She's sort of been the beacon of Miss Potential, a, a cute ditz that fills a slot, which is made worse in the next arc, where she's relegated to being a pageant participant. She's literally the top third prodigy in the entire country, and Horikoshi does nothing with that. Also, I'm just, I'm just not gonna, I'm just not gonna talk about Froppy. I, I really don't feel like talking about Froppy. Combine this with a couple of monotonous chapters, like literally Nidai just solves this whole thing in like, in like a page. And this arc is a personal mixed bag, but a forgivable one since this is Hori's first time making such a long arc. Luckily, this is pretty much where my negatives end. Stuck in the shadows of their boss's sabbatical, Shigaraki and his teammates begin the journey of discovering a world without all for one. One of Overhaul's bullets asked Togen twice whether or not Shigaraki told them anything of betrayal, and they, they say no, because it's true, he didn't at all. All he did was entrust them to stay true to themselves in the leak's message. They didn't need someone breathing down their necks to tell them what to do. What they had to do was simply whatever they wanted. This is all made especially poignant with Magnus' death. Shigaraki from Act 1 would have never taken this to heart, but because the League is forming more and more into a family, he not only cares but uses that emotional impact to motivate the League. Overall contrast this in the fact that he's sort of our first example of a capitalistic villain, making cork racing bullets to sell on the black market while giving antidotes to the heroes. His arrogance leads to him thinking that he's the only one that could bring back the Yakuza name. To give life into a dying organization, he justifies his own actions to himself because he hopes that externally he'll receive that same validation from the most important person to him. Overhaul behaves as a litmus test for both Shigaraki and Deku, to see where each of them are in their journey. More specifically, like Mirio to Deku, Overhaul is supposed to mirror the exact person Shigaraki is supposed to become, a leader with a plan, a goal, an ideal, and a leader that treats his teammates as top priority. Both come out of the arc learning that they have much more to learn, but they're ultimately on the right path. You know, emotionally. Oh, and last but not least... <clears throat> Aerie's probably the best female character in MHA besides Toga. She's a plot device, of course, but Hori doesn't hide it. Instead of trying to make her more than what she is, Horikoshi leans into the trope, making sure this archetype has an actual place in the story, and having that place in the story be very, very emotional. Her arc about overcoming her trauma, abuse, learning her power doesn't have to be something so dangerous, but something that can help others, as well as learning she doesn't have to sacrifice her own emotional stability to save others is not only great, but it directly parallels Izuku. It's through her helping someone like Deku help her that they could act as a codependent unit, rescuing one another from each other's inadequacy. 
This is also cathartic for Isuku because finally he got to save that little girl. She's an adorable side character that gives the series a chance to visualize trauma in a way that it couldn't before. Now, it's something tangible. Someone who represents the series theme so well, but someone that doesn't overstep Deku's arc. She actually enhances it. I love her so much, man. This arc has a lot of flaws, like a lot of flaws, but it does such good setup for Izuku's character along with Shigaraki's character, along with, yeah, admittedly the supporting cast that somewhat, they're easy to forgive. And I'm sure Horikoshi would do a great job at taking the elements introduced in this arc and giving them all satisfying payoffs and resolutions. Wait, why did the music cut off? Thank you for the segment, Nia. If you like their style, make sure to check them out. They make video essays as well, and their link is down in the description below. Jumping back to the anime adaptation for the overhaul arc, while it still wins plenty of awards in terms of fresh direction, pretty impressive lighting for the beginning portions, and probably one of the best episodes of the anime, there is quite a noticeable drop-off, not only in terms of adaptation quality, but also in terms of public reception in English-speaking online spaces. With the Provisional Hero License exam already having a boring adaptation, it was an exceptional hit for the overhaul arc's adaptation to be only of decent quality to some. It was riddled with inconsistent character arc, wonky proportions, and what some perceived to be an over-reliance on still frames. The Mirio episode was especially controversial due to it barely expanding on the source material and doing so with more still frames. Infinite 100% more or less carried the series at award shows and farmed quite a few million views on YouTube. For myself personally, Season 4 was still passable but definitely marks a downwards trend for the anime, especially when compared to Season 2. Speaking of Season 2, the overhaul arc of the manga also coincided with Season 2 of the anime premiering, which was largely responsible for the massive success the series saw due to an outstanding production by Studio Bones and their staff. Remedial Course is quite a small arc, and sets a precedent of some mini arcs in the series, for better or for worse, which we'll get to. To some, it's also incredibly boring. I think for being seven chapters, this arc is actually quite dense in terms of setup for the rest of Act 2, but this is one of the first arcs where we don't really get anything from the League of Villains since their introduction, and for some people, it really shows. I'll get more into that in the next arc though, so let's just get into the Remedial Course. We get to see more development for the characters from the other schools that were involved in the Provisional Hero License exam, which is neat, but there are four huge points going forward for the story as a whole in this arc, which which is funny for how short of an arc it is. People like to write off remedial course, but these are pretty big deals. The first point is that we are introduced to the concept of the quirk singularity theory. Nearly a hundred years ago, the idea of quirk singularity was presented. The idea goes that as generations follow one another, quirks will continue to mix and evolve, producing stronger and more complex quirks as time goes. This increase in strength and complexity will eventually lead to instability, as the human body doesn't evolve at the same pace as quirks. MHA at this point didn't really feel like it had an end game in mind. Not to say that it wasn't thought out or structured, but this was the first idea that was planted into the story to make us go, oh, so this is something that has to be solved. It helps put together a better picture of where MHA is headed. The second is that Bakugo shows just how far he has come in this arc, as we get some nice emotional progression from him with the boss baby. The kid who clearly thinks he is above everyone else is a fitting character for Bakugo to speak to. He tells him if you spend all your time looking down on people, you'll never be able to see your own weakness. The implications of this are pretty obvious. Third is that this arc often goes uncredited for the introduction of this concept, but this is the first time we see the possibility of saving without fighting. I don't know how this goes unnoticed, seeing as how that's the entire purpose of the arc and the next, but it implants the idea our head that maybe people can be saved without getting destroyed. Finally, number four, which has some pretty massive implications for the series going forward. Horikoshi is an abuse apologist. Just kidding, but this is definitely something that some people took away from these scenes. We get a glimpse into Endeavor for really the first time in the series. All we have known up to this point is that he is an evil abusive monster, but in my opinion, MHA does something daring here. It takes this absolutely reviled character and tries to humanize him without excusing his past actions and thrust him into the forefront. Endeavor, a character who felt forced into passing the torch due to his inability to compete with All Might, based his hero ideology and put his identity around strength. Oh, sorry, not that one. NG Todoroki was clearly supposed to be left in our minds as a mental note of just how bad Bakugo could have gotten had he stayed on his warpath of strength-based identity. It is no coincidence that the arc which shows us Bakugo's emotional development is also the one that displays the first sign of Enji Todoroki's. After All Might's fall in Kamino, Endeavor faces a wake-up call. He wasn't chasing this immensely strong All Might, but a skeleton of a man with fleeting power, and he still couldn't surpass him. This revelation put Endeavor's journey as a hero, no, his entire life into a new perspective. After achieving what he had always wanted in a shallow a way that he was not satisfied with, he is forced to view the warpath he had left in pursuit of that goal. A broken home life, abused children, and nothing to show for it. His conversation with All Might in this arc gives him the push that he needs to finally start clearing up the broken path he had left in his wake. It's this new mindset that gives us our initial sighting of Endeavor trying to be a better father towards Shoto. If you ask the community at the time, this however received a very mixed reception. Some were skeptical of the level of nuance that would go into such a serious topic for a shonen manga, as an abuse storyline like this hits home for quite a lot of people. Others thought that Enji didn't deserve atonement to begin with, as his actions 
were pretty despicable. For myself personally, I don't think we should gatekeep people from trying to improve themselves, which isn't the same as forgiveness, of course. There will be plenty more to talk about for the Todoroki family shortly, though, and that will wrap up remedial course. The school festival arc, or culture festival arc, whatever you want to call it, further builds on the idea I had spoken about previously of My Hero Academia starting to settle into where it wants to go for its endgame. This is also the point where you begin to see a strong divergence from the English-speaking and Japanese fandoms, with Japanese fans being quite fond of this arc and any student-related arc, but with English-speaking fans feeling like arcs like this are ultimately a waste of time and hoping to get more to the villain content. This is something that will be touched on in much more detail later. The anime adaptation for this arc was generally considered serviceable, and the concert scene at the time of writing is slowly approaching 100 million views, which is insane. In the spaces I occupy, this arc was often laughed off as filler or overall unneeded. To respond to that criticism, we first have to define what actually makes filler. Filler, by definition, is used for anime that shows us a story that was not originally present within the source material, often done because the anime's constant production cycle outpaces the manga, which was very frequent in the early days of anime. The school festival is something that is clearly in the manga, so what is it about the arc that people don't like? Generally, when people are accusing something of being filler, it's not because they feel it means the prior definition, but mostly because it bores them or doesn't contain elements that they like, and feel that if they skipped it, nothing would change. Basically, they deem this arc to be skippable and pretty pointless, or generally unneeded. In the context of the school festival arc, is that true? Well, absolutely not. This arc is one of the most important arcs of the series in terms of narrative development, with great foreshadowing for the future with mentions of the thief Harima and villain Destro, showcases of Deku's growth not only ability-wise as well as expanding our understanding of heroism. If you skip this arc and jump straight into Act 3, the series would make no sense. This arc shows the biggest milestone in Deku's skill growth so far, using shoot style and Air Force, two movesets he has developed himself to further separate him from the last generation, and using them in tandem to elevate himself to the next level. Deku is not only able to win, but he's able to win by himself and without destroying his body for the first time in the series. He begins to finally feel like he's making strides and reigning in the power of one for all, which has eluded him for so long. Also, to call back to an earlier point, his suit is evolving with him. These new support gloves are not only necessary for his development, even foreshadowing future events by having All Might say not to rely on support gear, but it adds a sort of completion of his color scheme, an added sense of cohesion to his already well put together character design. This act is colored by its attention to detail, and that's even shown in the way everything looks. I talked about this before in the remedial course section, but we're further shown that perhaps not everything could be solved with violence. Eri is a girl who had suffered tremendously due to the abuse from Overhaul, and was saved by fairly conventional heroic means. Let's put saved in immense air quotes, however. The school festival arc acts as a way to hammer in the lessons from remedial course, not only to the viewer, but also to Midoriya himself. We see it quite pertinently through Jiro that sometimes, fighting is not your only option, as her hard work comes through in the form of an amazing concert that not only lets Eri smile for the first time, but also relieves some of the stress that the students of UA have been feeling since the villain attacks. School festival also introduces two massively under rated villains, in Gentle and La Brava, mostly because it's hard to call them villains. Often thought to be a boring duo, these two villains are by no means evil. We are shown ordinary people and how they have suffered from aspects of modern hero society. Gentle Criminal in particular is an interesting foil for Midoriya, showing how just a bit of luck, or in Gentle's case, bad luck, can shape one's fate. They were both heavily affected by the idea of fame that is inherently tied to being a hero, but Gentle take it a step further. That is why when Gentle sees his old high school friend again, the words, who are you again, cut so deep. It was drilled into his heart to aim for fame, and now in his 20s, has been forgotten by even his schoolmates. It is this horrible feeling of being forgotten that pushes him to villainy. Labrava shows us a story similar to Toga, a societally frowned upon quirk and a desire to express said quirk or individuality, leading to her being bullied and shunned by her peers. The important part to keep in mind is again, these two villains are not downright evil. Some people have the potential to be brought back, and maybe the ascription of villain isn't suitable for some people. Throughout all of Act 1 and 2, our definition of villain is somebody who is doing pretty despicable and evil acts. Stain kills people who he doesn't see fit, muscular kills for fun, overhaul tortures as a child, and Shigaraki wants to destroy it all. Meanwhile, Gentle and Labrava are making YouTube videos. In other words, these are the first two people that are not only pretty objectively normal people, as opposed to malicious and twisted, but these two are the first antagonists Deku can actually understand. Maybe villains can be empathized with too. This arc also demonstrates to us that the series is capable of handling trauma. Ochako is grappling with the fact that Nairai died in her arms and she was powerless to stop it. Deku feels worthless because he once again had to rely on outside help to take down Overhaul, and Aria is saddled with the immense baggage of the physical and mental abuse she had suffered in the Shie Hisaikai lair. We are shown that Horikoshi is aware that you can't just wake up one day and bounce back from everything that happened in the Overhaul arc, and delivers us a fun slice of life arc of the kids who had experienced something pretty traumatic, trying to enjoy themselves once again. This is a point that will be especially important for Act 3, so let's put a pin in that for now. Without this arc, we'd miss out on characterization for characters like Jiro and Eri. We'd miss out on moments that build your investment in the cast. We wouldn't have been introduced to new methods of heroism. We would have never gotten to have seen a new perspective on villains that influences the story later on. We wouldn't have seen this god-awful beauty pageant scene, and most 
most importantly, our main character would not have progressed in any way at all. The school festival arc is by no means filler or skippable, and it's a shame that it's treated as more or less a joke by the online English-speaking fandom. During the school festival's run in the manga, season 3 of the anime also started premiering. I've already spoken about season 3 in both of these videos, but I'll touch on it one last time. Season 3 has some of the most memorable moments of the entire anime, adapted to an extremely high quality. Deku vs. Muscular and All Might vs. All for One are two of the best adapted moments. End of story. It was, however, dragged down by the aforementioned adaptation of the Provisional Hero License exam arc, which wasn't really anything to write home about and had some absolutely mind-numbing anime original content, which was pretty new for the series. This was also arguably the absolute peak of the series in Western fandoms, whereas in the Japanese fandoms, there would still be plenty more room to grow. Charming character interactions, dynamic character starting points, and an easy-to-swallow therapy for the trauma these kids have had to face. But fine, maybe this isn't as action-packed as you would have wanted. In that case, this next arc should do you tons of favors. Pro Hero is quite a unique time for My Hero Academia. Remedial Course was almost like an arc designed to test the waters of having no focus on the main character, and Pro Hero is where we begin to see him seriously double down on that concept. Pro Hero is also when we see the fruits of Horikoshi's new editor's labor. The new editor is Ryosuke Yoritomi, who also had a say in the production of the first movie. It's hard to say just how much of an influence Monji might have had over the series, but his tenure saw the amazing first act, and now the torch was being passed to Yoritomi, who would remain editor until the very end of the second act. What we would see with Yoritomi's occupation see as editor of MHA is a massive, and I mean massive, expansion in scope for what the series covers. It's impossible to know just how much of this Yoritomi was responsible for, but all we can say for sure is that a lot of ground was covered while he was the editor. Pro Hero is the first of many risks we see this series take, as we get nine chapters of focus on people who are not part of the main cast. That might not sound like a big deal, but Weekly Shonen Jump is a very MC-focused magazine, and making decisions like this can spell the end. What makes Pro Hero even more crazy than that is how he shifted the focus from the main cast to an abusive, horrible human being, and also convinced the audience to root for him. What better character to focus on, however, after the years of build-up on how flawed hero society really is, as we set our sights on a wife-beating child abuser who holds the most power in the nation. Endeavor is a terrible man, who hopes it's not too late to turn back now, as the weight of the nation now rests on his shoulders post All Might Retirement. As he burns away his past self symbolically and physically, he prepares to accept the role wholeheartedly. This portrayal, however, almost acted as a double-edged sword, especially after the anime's legendary adaptation of this arc. Endeavor became the center of years of online discourse, as not only did people feel he fairly didn't earn the right to be considered redeemed, but a much more nefarious aspect was creeping up. A subsection of weirdo abuse apologists who would defend everything Endeavor did, or even make excuses for the treatment of his family. Furthering this massive development on the flawed state of hero society, we also get the two figureheads representing society. We are officially introduced to the Hero Public Safety Commission, or HPSC for short, and of course, the number two winged hero, Hawks. Funnily enough, despite Hawks' massive success in terms of popularity, he was actually never thought of in the original outline for the series. And was a last-second addition to get the story moving in the direction Horikoshi wanted it to go. You can kind of tell, but this doesn't break immersion, as stories change, plans, and expand as they're written out more and more. As MHA was slowly expanding its scope, Hawks was yet another addition to that. A morally gray hero in a sea of great heroic people, who teams up with yet another not-so-squeaky-clean hero. Hawks speaks of making a society where heroes have too much time on their hands, and we get the idea of just how far he might be willing to go to make that dream a reality when we find out that he's acting as a double agent for the HPSC in the League of villains. He is willing to do the things that nobody else wants to do in order to reach his ideal society, all the while feeling like a bird trapped in a cage due to the watchful eye of the HPSC. Hawks and Dobby arrange for a high end to attack a big shot hero in order to prove Hawks' allegiance to the LOV, and it ends up being deployed on Endeavor, the now number one hero. This fight serves as Endeavor's first opportunity to show the nation exactly what he will do as number one. Hood, a no move valuing absolute strength above all, and wanting to get stronger and stronger, and Endeavor. The pro hero fight is used to demonstrate quite explicitly the Endeavor of old burned up and destroyed, as Enji quite literally kills the physical representation of the monster he used to be. Enji Todoroki, a person who obsessively chased the back of All Might which grew smaller and smaller, was never able to climb those mountains. He instead opted to breed an even better version of himself that could climb the mountaintops that he himself could not. This too, however, was quite the bumpy road and never quite led to where Enji had hoped. Instead, he did become the number one hero, just not through the means that he had wished. This drove Enji mad, as it put into perspective just how meaningless everything he had done up to this point really was. As he pondered exactly how to follow up the symbol of peace, All Might told him that he doesn't really have to. The symbol was Toshinori's thing, and Endeavor needs to find what is his. What comes to mind is a flashing image of wanting to secure a future for his children and the next generation. The pro hero arc in a lot of ways is definitely a peak of the series, even with how small it is. My only problem with this arc, and it's mostly in hindsight, is that this is where the series begins to waver on its themes of the next generation, as Endeavor becomes the one really spearheading the Todoroki family drama, 
and Shoto more or less takes a back seat in terms of pretty much everything for the foreseeable future. This fight also got some of the best animated sequences of the entire series. Seriously, this finale to Season 4 is legendary, and is one of the last bits of hype the series gets in anime form. We could talk much more about all this later though, besides all that, Pro Hero was fantastic. This will serve as our interlude, as this is also when the first MHA movie comes out. But I'm going to go ahead and hit off the three currently existing ones in this section, and maybe include any new movies that come out in the third part of the retrospective. To put it bluntly, the movies are some of the most mediocre MHA content to ever be produced, at times being downright insulting to the source material. Two Heroes, the first of the three currently existing movies, released in 2018 based on an original story produced by Horikoshi himself. The movie was a pretty big success, and was actually released in the US first as a thank you to the overseas fans, grossing 14.1 million USD in Japan, and 19.3 million USD in other territories, for a worldwide total of 33.4 million US dollars. The summary of the plot is that we get to see some of All Might's past and in the present, the kids and All Might go to a small island to hang out, I guess. But Doria gets this new tech item called Full Gauntlet, which has some pretty daunting implications for his arm consequences, and they fight a terrorist named Wolfram, until Midoriya and All Might beat him up. That's about all that mattered. Two Heroes is certainly the least egregious of the films, and to answer a question before it arises, yes, this movie and all of the following movies are considered canon. That's why I'm going to make them a big deal. Despite how goofy it is that All Might and Midoriya going to toe-to-toe -to -toe with a terrorist with connections to Offer One never being mentioned in the main story is, Full Gauntlet was pretty concerning when it first premiered as well. The biggest subplot for Midoriya at the time was the damage dealt to his arms and how he has to adjust to that revelation as he moves into becoming his own hero, but thankfully, it was never brought into the main story. <laughs> Heroes Rising, the second movie, released in 2019, which revolves around an original ending that Horikoshi had planned for My Hero Academia and takes place after My Villain Academia in this timeline. This movie was actually the least successful one despite having some of the craziest fan service imaginable, making 15.1 million in Japan and 13.5 million in US and Canada, totaling 28.5 7 million USD worldwide. The summary of this plot is that a lamer version of All for One, who has the copy of the AFO quirk, is let loose in an attempt to make a world ruled by those with strong quirks. They go to an island and beat the bad guy. Oh, and Midoriya gives Bakugo one for all. Yeah. That was Horikoshi's original ending. This would not be a problem if this were a non-canon film, but I will remind you, the movies are canon, and this was Horikoshi's original ending. The original ending, having the marginalized, discriminated child give away his one shot and making his goal a reality to his abuser, is absolutely fucking insane thematically. Midoriya working nine-hour shifts at a McDonald's register while Bakugo goes out and lives out his dream is, again, fucking insane. Not only that, but this also establishes a precedent of Midoriya doing this in fights. If the battle is tough enough, there's no reason for Midoriya to not hand out one for all like it's a virus so that they could overcome any obstacle in their paths, just for the quirk to go back at the end of the fight anyway. The power going back through quirk magic is also insane. What would have been infinitely more pleasing and in character would be for Bakugo to wake up and refuse to use All Might's power to become the number one hero, as he could do it on his own. Instead, we get this incredibly lame amnesia contrivance so that it doesn't rock the boat of the main series at all. Is the fight raw? Yeah. Does it look amazing? Oh yeah. Does it make any narrative sense whatsoever? God, no. This movie is actually horrible for the continuity of MHA and stands below F tier for me. World Heroes Mission, the third movie released in 2021 and I believe revolves around an entirely original story created by Horikoshi. It takes place during the time skip of the Endeavor Agency arc and is actually the best performing MHA movie by far. It grossed almost 30 million in Japan and almost 20 million in other territories for a worldwide total of nearly 50 million USD. The summary of this plot is that there is a doomsday cult known as Humorize that believes in the quirk singularity and their goal is to commit global terror acts to kill every single quirk user all at the same time. Our kids go around the world and disarm the bombs. They fight the bad guy, the end. While not being as narratively disgusting as Heroes Rising, this is still pretty bad. Our 16 year old cast is now responsible for basically saving the world three times and it's never mentioned in the main story at all, as if they share no continuity whatsoever, yet they're frequently referred to as canon events. Rhodey is a cool movie original character I guess. What's particularly awful about this movie though is what it means for Midoriya. He goes 100% on Fleck turn, beats the ever loving shit out of him, so hard he beats the blue out of him. Him, destroys his limbs and that's a wrap. Despite being told that he can only use his arms at 100% two or three more times, he suffers no consequences for what he does in this movie. World Heroes Mission did look really pretty though. I'll give him that. To summarize, the movies are really bad. Two Heroes is the best one because it does the least damage to the plot, but it's also the only movie I've ever almost fallen asleep watching. These are genuinely very bad films that you should not peep if you have the choice, unless you're looking for some dumb meathead fun or very basic fanservice content.
If you at all took part in the Western fandom of My Hero Academia, you would have heard all about this arc. For those unaware, in at least English-speaking fandoms, joint training is one of the most controversial arcs of the entire series. For its relatively smaller stakes, slightly asinine pacing in both the manga and the anime, as well as being a turning point for Deku's development going forward. We also see a small but negligible dip in sales in Japan, however that is likely due to the joint training volumes releasing shortly before Season 4's premiere. Coming fresh off the heels of Pro Hero, this arc suffered strong pushback due to the sudden and abrupt arc transition. Joint training starts right in the middle of a chapter dealing with the fallout of the Todoroki family drama. Not only were manga readers not happy, but it was especially bad for the anime image since Season 5 was heavily marketed around this arc, at a point where many fans in English-speaking communities were fed up with long training arcs revolving around 1A and the like. While the series is called My Hero Academia, at least in some English-speaking circles, the student side of the story tends to be marked as the least interesting part of the narrative, and after an arc like Pro Hero, who could really blame someone for asserting that? The expectations set by manga readers who can't shut the fuck up led to high expectations for Season 5 for anime onlys, and it was going to have to do a lot to regain the love and hype MHA once had in many communities. This was also the season that made it pretty clear that MHA coverage had slowly started to become less frequent on places like YouTube, Twitter, and so on and so forth. The controversial nature of this arc is founded on two factors. For one, JT is an arc that lacks pretty much any stakes for our characters besides some hastily introduced ones for Shoto, Shinso, and Tokoyami, as well as the intrigue as to what's going on with what for all. There is pretty much nothing going on here outside of that. There is nothing lost by either 1A or 1B losing to each other as this is just a training match, and there is nothing gained because the new moves this arc showcases are moves the characters have or would have thought of otherwise. That's what I personally don't like about JT, but some people enjoy that low-stakes kind of environment, especially given that it's a last hurrah for Class A before the climax of Act 2. Secondly, we have what is perceived to be the massive expansion of One for All in Midoriya's power set. The introduction of the Quirk Singularity and its manifestation within Midoriya allows One for All to become this sentient power, allowing him access to the other user's quirks. This was not taken well initially. Concerns of the series power creep were introduced, and concerns about Midoriya being able to use these newfound quirks as ass pulls in tough situations also arose. There was also a large subsect of people who thought it was a random development and didn't make any sense. Not unlike how the misinformed viewed the Deku vs. Muscular fight, saying Deku going 1 million percent is somehow an ass pull. The vestiges playing a more active role is something that was actually pretty heavily foreshadowed back in Season 2 Sports Festival arc, when they intervened to break Deku from Shinso's brainwashing. Some people, myself included, also argue that the nature of quirk passing in a world where quirks can assimilate into other quirks' cores, this was something more or less bound to happen, and also heavily predicted years in advance. Not only this, but from the jump, we learn that One for All is not only a quirk that passes on, but one that stockpiles. When was it ever said that the quirk stopped stockpiling after the first user? This quirk development started off highly controversial, and over time, manga readers became more comfortable with it, not only as time passed and their worries fell for naught, but also as Black Whip revealed itself to be an extremely interesting addition to Midoriya's kit. Despite it looking like mold in the anime adaptation, Black Whip is seriously one of my favorite quirks in the series for how versatile it is. And even after unlocking all of the quirks at this point, Black Whip still remains a standout for how interesting it is for him and how much it opened the door for MHA's choreography, something we touched on in the first video as being largely uninteresting. Anime viewers took this quirk development much easier. It's also the quirk that receives the most thorough deconstruction out of all of them, but more on that in a bit. As mentioned before, Ochako didn't really get to do much in the internship arc. She mostly supported either from the front lines or completely off screen. This along with how scattered her development is, has led people to, frankly, not really give a shit about her. While that's totally reasonable, Horikoshi's rotation-based pacing and wide-reaching focus in Act 2 has affected how people view her and even the rest of this class. He does rectify this in a smart way. Ochako doing nothing is something the story actually calls out. Her inability to save Night Eye or Midoriya pushes her thought process to become more broad and less about money or status. It's not just about wanting to support her parents financially, but now it's about supporting others through being a hopeful and helpful presence. She basically has her hero moment, running without thinking to save her friend in danger, something she couldn't get herself to do during overhaul. It's less of a change in ideals and more an expansion of one. This arc shows us a snippet of where Eri is at this point in the story as well. Nia stated before that Eri and Deku share similar arcs, learning that their destructive powers don't have to be such a burden on themselves, especially since that burden isn't really felt by anyone else. Matter of fact, both of their powers have only benefited other people. Deku's knife analogy pushes Eri's thinking in a very positive way, and also foreshadows how Izuku himself will be dealing with his power. If there was any doubt on how these two in MHA as a whole are building a theme of healthy codependency, then joint training outright gives us that and promises way more. This is very important setup, especially for the third act. Joint training's pacing is actually horrendous, by the way, in both anime and manga, which is impressive. It moves at a snail's pace, and in the manga has only 13-page chapters due to Horikoshi being sick and moving at the time, so you had a lot more time to be worried about the contents of 
episodes of the arc, as it always felt like we were going nowhere. What could have been done in 7 episodes in the anime was instead made 12 to 13, which is insane. A lot of people say that this was not only a good decision, but also the most predictable and efficient decision made by MHA's production staff, but this can easily be debunked by the fact that the anime painstakingly adds content so that each match gets 2 episodes. Joint training did massive damage to the western fandom, and the anime's shafting of My Villain Academia and reorganization destroyed it even further, as they put so much emphasis on JT as an arc. It prioritized content with Class 1A and the kids, rather than spending needed time on other arcs. I've already done a video on all of this, so check that out if you'd like. The arc isn't all bad. Like I mentioned earlier, the stuff with the multiple quirks in Midoriya was really cool. The pain of him having finally grasped his power, and being able to take down his first villain solo with no self-inflicted injuries, leading straight into him having this outburst, making him feel like he's lost control once again. Joint training has quite a few cool character moments among a sea of mid, and that is the best way that I can summarize it, as there isn't much else to say about it. Poorly paced, affected by the author's health and life situation, uninteresting events, lacking stakes, peppered with cool character work. I guess let's just get to the part everyone has been waiting for. After an arc that was not entirely interesting, we get to probably the most important arc of the entire series. My Villain Academia managed to undo the damage done in the English-speaking fandoms by the joint training arc. But it doesn't mean that it was beloved everywhere. MVA and MHA's villains in general have had a very tumultuous history. If we jump back to Act 1, do you remember the Forest Training Camp arc? The arc where all the villains interrupted the summer training and kidnapped Bakugo? This arc was cut extremely short by Horikoshi after its poor performance in the reader surveys the second the villains appeared. If you're wondering why this wasn't in Part 1 of the retrospective, well, that information just didn't exist yet. The easy takeaway from this is that the villains just don't do well in Japan due to cultural issues. The issue with this line of thinking arises when you ask a simple question, why? Why would that be the case? Are there literally no stories in Japan with likable or sympathetic villains? Of course not. There is in reality a much more simple, probable answer for this discrepancy. We have to stop viewing it as a West versus East problem, and to get to the bottom of that, we need to understand just how MHA is published. The simplified pipeline for a manga's creation is like so. The author creates the chapter, the editor approves the chapter or asks for changes, but ultimately submits it, it gets published in the magazine, and magazine readers rank their three favorite stories that week in the reader survey. If the survey is looking bad for you, it's time to think about shaking things up. The possible reason this is a problem for My Hero Academia, and this is speculation, I just want to emphasize that, is that the people who are deeply invested in the series enough to go online and talk about themes or dissect plotlines are not the people who are buying the magazines. They are usually buying volumes, reading online, or purchasing official merchandise to support the series. The magazine is a much more casual way to experience the series, and by extension, every series in Weekly Shonen Jump. You crack it open to read the heroes of the story doing cool shit, and put it down at the end of the day. So when these dudes you aren't super familiar with, and don't particularly care to spend the time analyzing their thematic relevance show up, you begin to lose interest. My Villain Academia is a complete bucking of this idea. Horikoshi once stated in Volume 7 that he wouldn't make villain character profiles because he wanted them to remain villainous and frightening, and shortly after experienced just how much the casual audience doesn't like the villains with the forest training camp arc. This arc is a true testament to Horikoshi's evolution as a writer, and exactly the point where the massive maturation of the series begins. Knowing how much his most important audience, magazine readers, does not vibe with the villains, he still decides to do one of the most ambitious things in Weekly Shonen Jump history. He uses this arc to display some absolutely gorgeous art that oozes expression and character, while taking very clear inspiration from real-world art and religious subtext. He humanizes the League of Villains by giving us payoff for all of the endeavors, successes, and failures that they had been through prior to this arc and using the humanization of these characters for some social commentary that we don't really see in most other arcs. All while executing this in such a unique way that Weekly Shonen Jump had never seen before, due to authors being very reluctant to shift the focus away from their main or most popular characters, and for Horikoshi to do this for half a real life year was not only unprecedented, but very ambitious and a very exciting premise that left a big impression on many fans. This arc cements the fact that the League of Villains are basically our second set of protagonists. Following up on the parallel development we talked about earlier in this video, we don't exactly know how casual magazine readers felt, but we could definitely see a stagnation of sorts in the volume cells after joint training solid showing. Like I said earlier, this is the point where MHA grows up, in a sense. Thanks to the very ambitious nature of MVA, the series' potential would now skyrocket due to a much-needed new layer of depth and complexity, as we now truly understood what made the LOV, but more importantly, our primary antagonist, Tick, as well as learning things like the origin of quirks, or the importance of themes like nature versus nurture, or freedom within the story. The League also becomes an actual threat logistically after their loss of all for one, and it leads to the stakes of MHA never feeling higher, and that imminent sense of danger that many felt was lacking in MHA finally showed its face. This is all done under the protagonist's nose, by the way. 
Clearly, we are on the precipice of something huge, as MVA was the biggest turning point in the series' history. It was when we finally begin to see the untapped potential of the series' primary antagonist, Tomura Shigaraki, a villain who had been clowned in online spaces for years and years for being a whiny manchild and having absolutely nothing to his name. For years, Shigaraki and by extension the League of Villains were seen as incompetent or hard to take seriously as villains. The central antagonist of the arc, the Metal Liberation Army, and the LOV's battle with them serves as a culmination of all their losses and improvements over the series, something we have been slowly building up to alongside the heroes. After the events of the USJ, Shigaraki learns to plan better and not act so boldly or immaturely, to not make such reckless decisions or lose his cool when faced with hurdles with his plan. This being combined with him learning to value his peers as equals and not just pawns, which is something the internship arc planted. In addition, the Stain arc taught him that he needs a proper doctrine or ideology if he wants to be a successful villain, or at least co-opt a successful ideology. The forest training camp shows us the first steps of maturation of Shigaraki, where he considers his allies comrades rather than disposable pawns. This arc and by extension Kamino teaches him the importance of bonds, trust, and patience. MVA shows Shigaraki applying all these lessons, and it's reflected in the familial bond the League of Villains has developed by the time we arrive at this arc. And his development stands out when he opts to use Verdestro's resources after winning him over, since it perfectly highlights how far he's come since being seen as a lame-ass man-child. In addition to elaborating on Shigaraki as a character, this also furthers his parallels with Deku, where Midoriya experienced the inequality of life as being born a corkless boy with nobody who supported his dream of being a hero, Shigaraki was born as a possibly late bloomer, or something else, but I won't speak on that. Born into a family who holds a disdain for heroes in general, despite his dream of being a hero. They also link up in that same regard. Insofar as the Shimura household hated heroes due to the hyperfixation on hero work, while Midoriya suffered from that same expectation placed on his shoulders in this modern society. The Shimura connection is important. Just how Shimura is the reason Tanko's victimhood warped into a murderer's hatred, Nana is the reason why All Might's heroism turned into something that inspired Izuku. These similarities are not reinforced only thematically, but also visually with certain framing of some scenes. Finally, MHJ gives up such an explicit answer as to where Midori and Shigaraki are headed, essentially being faded rivals. Up until this point, it felt like the endgame for our protagonist and antagonist character was not very clear, and 200 chapters in, MHA still felt like a piece of its puzzle was missing. With Shigaraki's backstory being inserted, we finally get that piece, and it becomes clear that Midoriya would have to be the one to step up and offer his hand to Tenko, an experience he craved all those years ago. This is shown where Shigaraki wonders if only someone had reached out to him. Toga is another character who benefited quite largely from this arc. We learn that her quirk led to a fairly poor upbringing for her, as she was rejected by not only society at large due to the nature of her power influencing who she is, but even by her own parents who looked down on her due to the quirk she was born with. She was raised wearing a mask over her true self, as it's important to keep in mind that the original translation of quirk, kose, quite literally refers to one's individuality, a mask that slowly slipped off as she was forced to be somebody she isn't, as she was shoved into quirk counseling that didn't quite meet her needs, until one day it all boiled over and she acted upon her impulses. This makes her finding the League an even more impactful event, as she wanders through life looking for a place to belong, a place that would accept her for the way she is, and finally, she finds people that will accept her and allow her to be her true self. This is just a great development for the story's themes of discrimination, and how that affects someone with a quirk that can't help but result in less than favorable instincts and inclinations. No longer does she have to repress her truest self to please society, and she can finally live freely as evidenced by her relationship with Twice. Twice is also a character who came out of MVA as a fan favorite. Not only did he massively benefit from stumbling upon the League just like Toga did in finding a place to belong, but he finally finds out what makes him an individual. His character is almost the opposite of Toga's in that respect, as pointed out by Skeptic. With his parents deceased and his job lost, Twice had nobody to turn to but himself. There were no safety nets in place to catch somebody in perpetual freefall. After a while, however, he learned he could not even trust himself due to his double quirk. Twice's relation to Hawks would become quite apparent in the following arc, as we see them both struggle with their own individuality. Twice, however, realizes that he is in fact himself, and knows he is not just a clone created by the original, and is finally able to let loose without fear. Horikoshi goes the extra mile by not letting his manic behavior go away once he hits a breakthrough in his trauma. These are still individuals with their own personality quirks and mental stability, and that's a small detail that otherwise would have made their arcs feel too rushed. Oh, and speaking of Hawks, as far as we're aware, he literally killed Best Genius to get encoded with the League of Villains. Let's keep that in mind for later. Last but not least, Spinner also finally gets some characterization in this arc. He steps up and figures out what he wants to do with himself, after months of stumbling around following the footsteps of Stain and Shigaraki. He accepts that his life will be one of Shigaraki's right-hand man, and subjects himself to his will. The arc also explores the League's ties to each other. We see them interacting in their day-to-day, -day, just how we get to see the heroes all the time, but to see this of our antagonistic force is something truly unique in the Weekly Shonen Jump magazine. We get to see them at their absolute lowest and still stick together, which is establishing a found family motif with our villain squad, especially pertinent when we get scenes of them down on their luck, contemplating how if they had simply gone with Overhaul's promises, they'd be wallowing in money and eating food like sushi right about now. <laughs>
The sushi talk, which is then remembered weeks later by Shigaraki after he uses the MLA money to treat his friends to a good meal. MVA shows us that these aren't two-dimensional comic book villains anymore, but that these are real people with their own flaws, connections, and backstories that make them the people they are today. Shigaraki in particular has a backstory that is so unbelievably impactful and informs many of the themes that the series we've become so familiar with, including just how much they both fed into the existences of our protagonist and antagonist. The antagonists of this arc, while ultimately underwhelming, still offer quite a lot to the series as a whole. The MLA introduces us to some quirk lore, like how they used to be referred to as meta abilities, and how quirk liberation movements of old operated, while introducing our second coherent ideology to the series, even if it ends up half-baked at certain points. As a whole, they embody this mentality of self-liberation, wanting to live in a society that's free and enabling quirk use. They're sort of meta-human radicals in that way. Gettin especially takes this ideology a step forward by saying those with stronger meta abilities should have even more freedom. In addition, Redestro is far from the most complex or even best MHA antagonist, but still ends up a very likable and entertaining character whose motivations are understandable. Him and the MLA is something many fans did not see coming and stuck with quite a few people, and how they're used to expand the arcs of the League should not go underappreciated. This arc, funnily enough, is also when the misogyny allegations started ramping up big time, as Curious was literally the only character to die throughout the entire sequence, and some saw this as a very strange trend for My Hero Academia going forward of heavily maiming or killing female characters. How you feel about this is up to you, but it's definitely noticeable. There were also weird assumptions made about Twice and Toka's relationship, but we don't need to get into that. The League of Villains defeat the Metal Liberation Army and officially combine into the Paranormal Liberation Army. We see trends of Japanese kegare, or defilement, in people like Toka, who feel like a direct reference to the Barakum in People of Japan, and these organization names feel almost directly inspired by the Baraku Liberation League. Possible some inspiration was taken from these real-life events and concepts. While I obviously can't go super in-depth here to keep true to the retrospective's chronological order, it's clear that this arc is loved and very important for a reason. It's considered by many, myself included, to be the best story arc of My Hero Academia. This arc did so much work for the series that from now on, it will be quite a popular take to say that the villains carry the series, which makes it all the more frustrating about how dog shit the anime adaptation for MVA was, and instead focused on the most controversial arc of the story, and MVA's anime adaptation marked a major shift for MHA's reputation as a whole, which we can further get into in the Act 3 video. I've already mentioned my lengthy video about everything wrong with Season 5 and MVA's adaptation, and to summarize it further, MVA's adaptation has some of the least consistent character art and animation the series has ever seen, with absolutely nothing strong coming out of it, as well as having its entire outcome spoiled with twists and turns burned out by an arc switch, putting Endeavor Agency before MVA in the anime. It is an absolutely nonsensical choice which completely and utterly killed hype for the MHA anime and online spaces, and Season 5 was also one of the lowest viewed ever in Japan. The adaptation for this arc was nothing but a complete disservice to this absolute behemoth of an arc, as evidenced by just how much time I was able to spend talking about it. But finally, we can move on to the penultimate arc of Act 2. Finally, we get to the second to last arc of My Hero Academia's second act, the Endeavor Agency, the short-lived calm before the storm in a sense, as we rapidly barrel towards our climax. With the events of MVA and Deku City fresh in our minds, we understand this underlying sense of dread that underlines our trio training together under Endeavor's tutelage. Endeavor Agency began two primary things that readers might remember. Number one, it began an unbelievable stretch of MHA, which will probably be looked back at as the golden age of the series. With the villain arc, the Endeavor Agency arc, and the upcoming war arc, we were at unprecedented times of greatness. Second, Second, it began a period of time where it was quite apparent that Midoriya had taken a backseat in his own story. Even on rereads, it still feels like a chunk of time with him is missing, but on a weekly basis, it was definitely something to be away from our MC for so long, as people were desperately hoping for some more characterization for our protagonist. While Endeavor Agency does have some Deku shine since he is the MC, it mainly focuses on the Todoroki family, as implied by the name, which becomes quite a massive subplot for the series, for better or for worse. Obviously, this will culminate in excitement for when we would get back to that eventual Deku focus, but for now, it's been more than made aware that Horikoshi is simply focusing on world building and his other characters in this act. Before I talk about the greatness of the Endeavor Agency, I would like to touch on some things that felt like they came up short or were lacking. A common complaint of Endeavor Agency is that, well, the agency part of this arc was more or less skipped. We seldom get to see the trio train together or do any real hero work together, and we learn the ins and outs of professional heroism, something terribly apparent by a time skip that skips over everything of potential interest. This hurts a bit more given how this is an arc centered around the origin trio, the three most popular characters in the entire series, and while their dynamic leaves things to be desired, it at least would have been fun to see how they and their quirks bounced off of each other, especially while working under Endeavor. The anime compounds this problem, doing absolutely nothing creative with the adaptation of this arc, even though it tries by including some interesting anime original scenes, and a couple of worthless OVAs, an episode about Ochako stopping 9-11? and a terrible movie taking place during the time skip. I'm sorry, but the anime adaptation for this arc is, to put it lightly, absolutely dreadful. Since it is placed before MVA, most of what made it good is pretty much obliterated. It removed every drop of tension Endeavor Agency had, and made it seem like it's just a boring training arc to anime-only viewers. This alongside joint training absolutely destroyed the MHA anime reputation to people in online spaces. The adaptation is an extremely visually boring screenshot gallery filled to the brim with horrible flashbacks and even worse pacing, with one episode even adapting a singular chapter. That episode had 
so much padding, we spent more time on Endeavor in a chair than the family drama itself. Not to mention the dog shit filler episode thrown in to promote the third movie. The saving grace was definitely the street fight with the trio versus ending. Really good animation and art direction with strong music to boot. But it definitely wasn't worth the hassle. Anything that wasn't Todoroki family focused in this arc was quite hastily thrown together. Such as Midoriya's mastery of Black Whip, a quirk he had unlocked only a little bit ago and had told himself he would not use this power until he had mastered one for all, suddenly he begins using Black Whip and within a week uses it extraordinarily well with no backlash. This would form a sort of expectation for things to come with Midoriya's power progression post joint training. More on the origin trio, I don't know if I personally subscribe to this complaint, but there is also something to be said about just how many people are not interested in the triad's dynamic. Some people preferred earlier trios with the likes of Midoriya, Uraraka, and Ida, and found the origin trio to be massively lacking when it comes to how they interact with each other. Our response to this is that that is just the nature of heroism. It's a job, and you're not always going to be working with those who you're best friends with, but with those who suit you and your skills more. A concession can be made that the trio is made up of better and more fun duos, a highlight being the new Bakugo and Shoto dynamic built up from their one-sided rivalry at the sports festival, but for me personally, there isn't really a problem with giving this trio some spotlight. Now, of course, I must say just how amazing the Todoroki subplot is in this arc. Seeing a man like Endeavor, someone who has done genuinely terrible things, attempt to better himself, and seeing the reactions of that through the entire family is a genuinely amazing portrayal of family trauma. We see Fuyumi and her desperately wanting her family to be whole again. We see Natsuo who can't stand the sight of this abusive bastard and can never remove what Endeavor had done to Toya and Shoto from his mind. We get Shoto, someone torn down the middle, a boy who despises his father for what happened to his mother and of course even himself, but a boy who sees his father trying to do the right thing. The best part about Endeavor Agency is that it never tries to portray any of these perspectives as invalid. We feel for all of the children of the household and understand how they got to the point where they're at. Something else that sets this arc apart is how Horikoshi isn't trying to nauseatingly force us to think Endeavor is good and should be forgiven, actually. What he instead does is separate forgiveness and atonement. His family doesn't have to forgive him, and Endeavor doesn't even necessarily want forgiveness, he simply wants to do what is right, what he should be doing for his family. This becomes abundantly clear when by the end of this arc, he opts to remove himself from the family's home so that they can live their day-to-day -day without him. This distinction between forgiveness and atonement is what forms the stepping stones for this plotline's success, and leads to even more introspection down the line pertaining to even more introspection from Endeavor. It wouldn't be fair to not mention Hawks in this equation either. While having a really small role, his presence as an informative double agent not only adds to the tension building into the next arc, not only allows the audience to get a peek into how the villains are doing during this time, we literally see Shigaraki building a body capable of all for one, but also enables an ongoing motif in his involvement with the Toto fam drama. The next two arcs explore that involvement further, but him being willing to communicate with inside information to Endeavor first, and Endeavor almost immediately understanding what Hawks is trying to say implicitly, lends again to a building of their dynamic. Plus, it's always just a treat to see Hawks. In short, people who think MHA fell off after MVA sound ridiculous. This arc not only furthers the threads left from My Villain Academia as well as the tension, it also serves to boost several different plotlines, like Midoriya's own personal training, the Todoroki family drama, and even a little bit of Bakugo. While myself and many others wish this arc could have done more with its premise, it was still a very solid arc overall, and helped contribute to MHA's golden age. Welcome to the final arc of Act 2, which serves as this act's Kamino, an arc that completely and utterly shakes up the world and the status quo of the story. Speaking personally, this was the most hype a weekly experience has ever been for me. Every single chapter was incredibly interesting and dripping with the utmost rawness and swag. Seeing the culmination of over 250 chapters of slow buildup explode into the absolute chaos that was the PLW arc was an amazing experience, one that actually at one point out-trended the American 2020 presidential election. While it definitely did well in online spaces, it also did great in sales. It didn't push the numbers, but it seemed to maintain a consistent sales count that made us think that perhaps the series had just evened out at a pretty solid amount. We don't know how the anime adaptation for this arc has gone, as at the time of uploading, it literally just started, but we will definitely circle back to it in the Act 3 video. Ironically, this arc does not start off too well. We open up on the Kurogiri interrogation, which most would consider the series' biggest fumble at the time. This is because all the investment and build-up to this reveal was actually shoved into the canon spin-off My Hero Academia Vigilantes, a painfully boring read besides this stuff right here. So if the only thing you consume is the main story, a large part of Aizawa's characterization, which makes him a much better and more relatable character, as well as gives context which makes sense of Kuragiri and any possible investment in the Shirakumo guy lacking. Regardless of this, however, the reveal that Kuragiri is actually Aizawa's old friend is good set dressing to set off the storm that had finally arrived. This moment helps humanize Aizawa and sets us up to want to see the Doctor in the League of Villains fall. However, that's just a rough patch. The series not having well-defined stakes is a common criticism, so stakes are something people who watch MHA have always felt was lacking because there was no arc like this war arc. So when we watch a major character actually die, another get permanently injured, Shigaraki decaying an entire mountainside, and Gigantamachia's rampage 
Age, it's easy to understand why this arc was such a satisfying hype experience for most. MHA is a story that progressively gets darker and darker, and shows a more realistic side of what a superhuman society would look like over the course of the series, starting from the hopeful hero school and winding up here. A battlefield filled with casualties and showing the realistic consequences of a heated, large-scale collision like this, and people expected this to be a massive wake-up call for heroes, hero students, and civilians alike. The first major event of the arc is Hawks vs. Twice and Dobby, an incredibly emotional and deeply thematic encounter. A prominent theme for MHA's villains is how your life can completely shift for the worse via one bad day, and this battle perfectly encapsulates that by impeding three fan favorites against each other despite sharing a great amount of similarities. Not only does this fight manage to deliver arguably the most poignant narrative in a fight within the story, but it does so while setting the bar for the war stakes incredibly high by having the series kill its first major character, Fuck You Night Eye and having Hawks' wings reduced to ash. The Hawks and Twice dynamic is one that has been building in the background for months now, and we see Hawks fight someone he understands. For the first time probably in years, Hawks slows down to help someone who's shackled by their lack of freedom, just like he is, and it's through that lack of freedom that Hawks gives Twice the finishing blow. Hawks being shrouded by darkness, trying to lift Twice out of that darkness, is ironic, given how Twice is depicted as being the light in the scene. This is where Hawks' morally gray double life comes to a head, making a decision that someone born of uncorrupted altruism would never succumb to. Unfortunately, Hawks' heroic nature has been morphed into some Something that it isn't, rendering him as the darkness. This fight has caused arguments to this day, as people feel that Hawks was in the right to kill twice, and that twice deserved a second shot. A bird trapped in a cage versus a man trapped in the cycle of villainy. Truly the most compelling battle of My Hero Academia. Moving on, Shigaraki waking up after the heroes raid the hospital has gotta be one of the greatest chapters in the entire series. Shigaraki awakens in some vestige or dream world, surrounded by not just crumbling homes, but a crumbling society. His one true desire, to destroy it all, personified. Hands float through the scene, decaying from the wrist up. You can also notice that a vast majority of the hands in the scene are pointing in his direction, yet they decay. Mention this in another video, check that out too, hands are meant to represent connection. It's as if the decaying hands represent Shigaraki feeling no one will reach him, the same way he felt on the day of his taking in by AFO and his grooming into the monster he has become. Shigaraki, who supposedly deemed his family unnecessary in My Villain Academia, regresses for a moment here. We see him confront his family and treat them quite normally. It's as if he's coming to terms with the last bit of familial connection remaining. AFO then appears and demands he come to him now, but his family grabs him and stops him in his place, begging pleading with him not to forget. His family wants to stop him from marching forward towards the devil, but Shigaraki sees it as rejecting who he is, so he destroys that last bit of connection that may lie dormant within himself, and marches towards a cross-like figure. To the Shimura family and the reader, all for one is more like the devil. To Shigaraki, all for one is the one who reached his hand out and saved him on that one bad day. He finally wakes up, or more accurately, comes back to life, and destroys everything in his vicinity. Shigaraki, in a sense, gets an I am here moment to starkly contrast with Midori and All Might, as he rises from the rubble in all his angelic glory and proceeds to wreak absolute havoc on Japan. Shigaraki Shigaraki's speech about the dichotomy between heroes and villains is so poignant, because while we're aware of everything he's saying, hearing Shigaraki say this aloud, and essentially declaring that he's truly coming to his own as a villain, is so satisfying and sends chills down the spines of everyone. We also see that the lingering vestige of All for One clings onto Shigaraki's subconscious, but he completely rejects the Demon Lord, saying he wants to be better than him, and that his body is his own, effectively separating himself from AFO and becoming his own symbol of terror. Him mirroring the sense of death that AFO gave off in Kamino is another point of satisfaction, and leads to yet another riveting battle, where we see a a desperate attempt for the heroes to just survive. The Shigaraki battle is an amazing example of not only the stakes increasing, but of just how incredible of a weekly raid this was, as we get to watch Aizawa get permanently injured and even cut off his own leg in the rawest way possible. This couple with a backsplash of his students and droplets of airy panels makes plot points like the Shirokumo stuff and how that's made him sort of a protective parent make the build up worth it. In addition, we see Gran Torino getting punched through his gut, which yes, is a good moment, and Endeavor fighting for his life against a Shigaraki who's willing to mock and maim him. The climax of Bakugo's character arc, where his mindset finally shapes into something that instinctively considers someone else, aka his long-awaited hero moment, and in between all of this, we cut back and forth between Gigantomachia's rampage, which shows us a jaw-dropping scale of destruction, something that has never been seen before in My Hero Academia. This was shaping up to give us something like a post-apocalyptic version of Japan. Watching the students struggle and try not to break out of the pressure of Makia's rampage as their development and training is put to the test is awesome, and all of the possibilities for these characters following the battle was super exciting, like the Kirishima and Mina scenes, or Momo finally stepping up and taking hold of the plan from her now-deceased mentor Midnight another loss for the hero side that can have a deep effect on our students. Midoriya, in a rage seeing Aizawa passed out and Gran Torino at death's door, activates his next quirk, Float, against Shigaraki, effectively turning it into a 1v1. Float is an example of an unfortunate shift in Horikoshi storytelling, as he gets into the groove of hype first, explanation later writing. A moment which could have easily worked if it happened in real time, instead of time skipping two months, was relegated to a cliffhanger and a flashback. A great flashback chapter at that, showing him and Ochako actually interacting and training together for once, along with some of the other kids, while also giving insight into Bakugo 
was character of his past in One for All as a whole. While the float reveal was lacking, I can forgive it because what it led to is one of the greatest fights I've read weekly. Midoriya's self-sacrificial nature is finally explored instead of just being poked at, as he decides to destroy himself in order to take down All for One right here, right now. His self-worth also comes into question, as he doesn't see himself as Midoriya Izuku, but he sees himself instead as a vessel for One for All, designated purely for this moment of destroying Shigaraki and All for One. He effectively dehumanizes himself to justify the situation he's in, and the narrative quite literally gives us a reminder of the state of Midoriya's arms according to his doctor. This served as a fantastic way of executing and ramping up the idea that Deku has a lot of underlying issues that obviously aren't addressed in a manner it deserves in the middle of a battle for the entire nation. This is especially pertinent to keep in mind as Midoriya had been more or less on the back burner as a character since the school festival arc, an arc that ended two years prior, so this was extremely cathartic to see. This also leads us to yet another peak chapter for PLW, as Bakugo is just as aware as the viewer that what Midoriya is doing is not good. Bakugo, who had been pushed to the background, which makes sense as he was learning not to be the star of the show, cooks up a plan to finish the fight out quickly and save Midoriya. This is his biggest moment since Provisional License, as he flies Endeavor up to try and kill Shigaraki, but unfortunately, doesn't work, due to Shiggy relinquishing control to All for One. Shiggy, for one, sends spikes towards Midoriya, and Bakugo takes the hit for him before his body can think. While this moment is amazing for Bakugo, Shiggy, for one, remarks how pointless it was, which is true, and Bakugo isn't the main character, the strongest, nor even the smartest. His hero moment, aside from the meta context, meant nothing. It is purely important on a personal and emotional level for Bakugo's character and Midoriya, who has to witness it. This event, or Chapter 285, was officially the last chapter that editor Yoritomi was replaced with the brand new editor to help close the MHA, Taguchi. As mentioned previously, Yoritomi is someone who might have helped Horikoshi massively expand the scope of My Hero Academia for better or for worse, but his potential work at least helped us get some amazing arcs. And now, he has been replaced with Taguchi, someone famously known for being the Grim Reaper of Weekly Shonen Jump. Whether that reputation is based on truth or not is hard to say, as it's very hard to determine just how much an editor is responsible for. All that can be said, for sure, is that Taguchi was the editor for many, many cancelled series. Even with that in mind, maybe he will prove to be more of a help than a hindrance? Moving on, Shigaraki grabs Midori and attempts to take one for all, but instead gets taken to the Vestige Realm, where it's revealed that due to Shigaraki's time in the tank being too short, he needs to finish finalizing his body before he can successfully take one for all. During this altercation, while all for one is slowly suffocating Tomura, Midoriya instinctively rushes to aid Shigaraki. On a week-to-week, -week, this was definitely some out-of-the-box behavior for even Izuku, but as we'll see, it will lead towards his biggest development yet. After this, we cut to Ochako versus Toga, a conflict in the making for, believe it or not, the entire act. Ochako, who has been battling with the notion of being a hero who saves other heroes since Overhaul, finally comes to grapple with saving someone who isn't a hero, but a villain, which comes after her inability to empathize with Toga from where she was coming from, and Toga feels like she gets the answer to the question she asked in PLE, about just how far some heroes will go to save someone. It's a shame that this fight was squeezed between Deko vs Shigaraki in the Makia moments, because it was great for both of their characters, but unfortunately got a bit overshadowed. Hell, people were saying PLW was too slow by this point. Do you remember back in the Act 1 video, where I said that the theory spawned about the missing Todoroki sibling? This is the first major theory to ever get confirmed in the absolutely amazing Chapter 290. This reveal was so hype, it quite literally outtrended the ongoing US 2020 presidential election at the time, and still maintains a spot as one of the best chapters of the series, a plot twist everyone saw coming, but with some of the best execution in the history of My Hero Academia. A plot twist does not necessarily have to be something hidden from the viewer, or something inherently shocking. It can in fact feel quite rewarding as a reader to put the pieces together and instead of having a writer arbitrarily change directions because it got predicted, instead reward their investment by confirming their suspicions. Endeavor, at the absolute peak of his atonement arc, gets torn the fuck down by the son he had abandoned. We've gotten a couple of bits and pieces informing us that something terrible had happened to Toya, but now we're no longer left to fill in the blanks. Toya laughs at Endeavor's attempt to look forward to the future and tells him the past never dies. Toya cleverly uses his story and broadcasts it to the entire world, pinning the killings of Dobby on Endeavor's flames, and manipulating the sequence of events in Hawk's killing twice to absolutely shake hero society to its core. Chapter 290, however, is the last hurrah of MHA as we know it. Starting from here on out, whether it be a stylistic change from Hori, or the influence of the new editor Taguchi, we are now on a completely different course pacing-wise, as we get a string of some pretty weak to even bad chapters that negate proper build-up for reveals and cliffhangers, an unfortunate sign of things to come. Best Genius returns and stops Dobby, removing the weight and moral greatness of Hawks' actions, which undermines Hawks' character if his questionable actions are just undone. We get the long-awaited Miriam return, which is actually awful. Mirio and by extension Ares' plotlines are absolutely blown apart for the sake of a hype cliffhanger, and are rapidly concluded in a flashback page or two. We finally get Bakugo's hero name, which isn't egregious in itself, but feels weak sandwiched with all these other reveals, despite the genuinely funny reactions we get from it. We then get another reveal, when Compress reveals his origins as being related to the legendary thief Oji Harima, which 
who fucking cares? We get Deku unlocking a quirk we've never heard about before, altering the way in which we grow with Deku during his quirk application. And finally, the battle ends as Mr. Compress is taken in, and All for One fully takes hold of Shigaraki's body, and they retreat, as Deku tells Shigaraki that he looked like he needed saving. We get the aftermath chapters, which are, for the most part, actually pretty good, which shows us the wide scale of destruction of Japan. We get to see Ochako and some frogs saving people from collapsing buildings, and Ochako firsthand seeing heroes find out that they are not suited for this job as they hang up their capes for good. As stated before, we also get confirmation of Midnight's death, an important supporting cast member for many of the kids' arc. I'm sure this will lead to some interesting introspection in the future, especially for someone like Momo who learned a lot from her, and Mita who has now gone through her first significant emotional breakdown, breaking away from her stereotypical preppy nature. We then get the highly anticipated prison breakout arc, except it's not an arc, and it happens in 18 pages. That sucks. But I suppose it's pretty straightforward content anyway. All for One is free, and so are many of the villains Midori has come to encounter, like Moonfish, Muscular, and Overhaul. What this could mean for a future arc is promising to say the least. Radesho's twice cloned before twice his death destroys the Hero Public Safety Commission HQ and kills the, at the time, president of the HPSC. This couple with the loss of Hawks' wings are making some fans question if Hawks was now truly free, from both the quirk that forced him into a life of espionage and also from the organization that took him in and trained literal child soldiers. We get an answer to this almost immediately. Hawks gets his own backstory, coming from a dirt poor abusive household, so poor in fact that the heroes didn't even attempt to operate there. He simply thought that they were fictional characters. This backstory basically cements his involvement with the Toto fam. While Dobby was destroyed by the abusive father that was Enji, Hawks finds hope in the hero that is Endeavor. This all happens because All Might figures were simply too expensive to buy for the little guy. Endeavor is literally the poor man's version of All Might. That is just cruel, Horikoshi. This is when we get yet another grand reveal that Hawks' wings are growing back? Uh, okay. Currently, Hero Society is in absolute shambles, and all of the blame was being placed on Endeavor's shoulders, while he also has to grapple with the fact that Dobby is his long-lost son. We see that while purchasing women to breed children with them is extremely odd to put it lightly, Endeavor wasn't necessarily a bad parent to start. Toya was not the perfect child he had envisioned, but he still wanted to help fuel the flames of ambition within him. After he sustained more and more injuries due to his quirks backlash, however, Endeavor forced him to stop. The problem was, this was all Toya had. It was the only way that he could seek approval from his father, and his dream in ways of paternal approval had now been stripped from him, as Endeavor attempted to reproduce a replacement for Toya, Q shows how being born. Toya, who ended up presenting his replacement, kept training in secret in hopes he could impress his father, but it only brought out the worst in Endeavor, who kept spiraling down as All Might's back grew further and further away, until Toya incinerated himself on Sakoto Peak, because all he knew how to do was turn up the heat. In the midst of reflecting on all of this, Shoto says to himself that he will have to be the one who handles Toya, until five seconds later, when his mom comes back and says, okay, never mind, we'll handle them together, dad. This is when we get the unfortunate news, One for All is now a known name, and Hawks wants to know more about it, but All Might says he will tell them everything. Q chapters 304 and 305, some of the best Midoriya character work of the entire series. Phenomenal chapters. We learn that Midoriya has unlocked Danger Sense, the fourth user's quirk, who died due to old age. In fact, if it wasn't because of the dangerous life from hero work, all of them did. It was as if One for All was sapping away their power source. The reason the quirk is acting in this way is because these users aren't quirkless. This is a big reveal for the series. We learn that Midoriya might be the very last wielder of One for All due to the ever-decreasing population of quirkless people, and having OFA alongside another quirk basically kills you. We also learn this is basically Horikoshi's fuck you to anyone who thought Deku being weak or quirkless made him the wrong choice for an MC. Literally, every other choice would have died. But more depressingly, that means the responsibility of ending All for One falls only on Midoriya's shoulders. No more generational gaps, it has to end here. That is when Nana Shimura asks the important question, can you kill Tomura Shigaraki? The page of Midoriya telling him that he wants to save him with the backdrop of a decimated Japan was something highly, highly, highly criticized, but to be quite honest, it's extremely fitting for Midoriya's character thus far and completely defines the third act of My Hero Academia. He grapples with the concept himself, he clenches his fist, unsure if what he wants to do is the right thing. Would understanding Tomura Shigaraki help save that crying little boy inside of him, or would it still lead to him having to kill him? He acknowledges the hurt that Shigaraki has caused, the lives he has taken, the people close to him that he has hurt, and Deku doesn't forgive him. We see exactly how he feels about Shigaraki in the war. He will never forgive him, and he had certainly tried to kill him prior. What makes this so great is how nuanced it allows Deku to feel. He still feels the hurt and the anger that Shigaraki had caused him and doesn't forgive him, but still, through it all, he comes to the conclusion that one for all is a power to save, not kill. He doesn't know if it'll work, or if it's the best path to take, but we get to see exactly what's going on in Midori's mind. He wants to save that little boy, or at least try to. While most of the predecessors consider this the right answer, it seems the second and third users of one for all, do not approve of this mindset. In the final chapter of Act 2, Hawks and Endeavor get grilled by the media for the things that have been revealed about them. The questioning of Hawks and the gravity of him killing twice feels absolutely lackluster, but Endeavor resolves that he will shoulder the blame for everything, telling the critics to direct their criticisms and doubts onto him, not at the people who will be putting their lives on the line. Just like in the pro hero arc, he tells the crowd to watch him. As if this moment wasn't powerful enough, we then find out Midoriya had left notes to all of his classmates spilling the beans about everything, and we see a beaten down, tired Midoriya standing on a tower watching a giant villain attack, paralleling him in Chapter 1, as we find out that he had dropped out of UA 
End of Act 2. Act 2 had ended on an absolute high note, with one of the most hype reveals ever, and the note that we are now in the endgame of My Hero Academia. The reveal that this was the end was met with many, many mixed opinions. Some people thought that this was far too early and MHA still had much to explore. Others responded with that Act 2 was four entire years long, so Act 3 could be just as long, and others couldn't decide what an act actually was. I said in Act 1 that after Kamino, hype was at an all-time high, but now? Even though the anime was giving a pretty shameful display, we at least had amazing chapters to look forward to. We were about to enter a new era of My Hero Academia, and with society absolutely crumbling, trust in heroes eroding, Shigaraki slowly being perfected with All for One taking hold, and Midoriya out of UA, things can only go up from here, right? Thank you so much for watching. This video was months of work. Uh, if you liked it, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you want to see videos similar to this one. Uh, you can also check the description down below for all of the social media of every single person who helped me through this, uh, everyone who worked on the script, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, where I'm objectively correct at all times, and you can join my Discord down below, where we talk about My Hero Academia, Ray Zero, Jujutsu Kaisen, and stuff like that. Thank you everyone so much for watching. See ya.